Hey everyone, Mr. Harvey here. Let's continue our lecture on Romanticism. So, in the previous lecture, ladies and gentlemen, I talked about the Romantic movement, right? And this was a movement that was a reaction uh, against the Enlightenment, a reaction against the French Revolution, a reaction against reason, all right? Uh, and we talked about some of the major themes within that. Um, today, I want to focus on some of the major artists, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to talk about some of the major uh, mediums uh, within the Romantic movement, starting with poetry, okay? Poetry, ladies and gentlemen, was really important within Romanticism. The Romantics believed that poetry was uh, the, the most, the best, the supreme form of all literary forms because it was, uh, it gave the greatest expression of one's soul. It gave uh, the greatest window into humankind. And we're going to talk about a lot of different poets, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and there are poets all over Europe. Um, but uh, one of the most famous was uh, von Guth from Germany, uh, and part, part of his po poems and his writings uh, were romantic, uh, while others were kind of critical of romanticism. But what made his poems very romantic and very much an embodiment of romanticism was the emotion, the feeling, the human subjectivity, really uh, delving into the human experience, okay? Uh, and we're going to look at, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, Guth later. Uh, but that human element, really important. Subjectivity versus objectivity. The subjectivity of Romanticism versus the objectivity of the Enlightenment of the French Revolution, right? That reason, right? Remember, Romanticism is a reaction, a negative reaction against the Enlightenment and against the French Revolution and against reason. Okay, uh, there's some more uh, uh, po po um, poets that we're going to talk about in England. Uh, there's two really important ones. There's Coolridge and Wordsworth. Um, Coolridge, ladies and gentlemen, was a master of the supernatural, a fantasy, a master of gothic poems, and those are very much elements of romanticism. Remember, uh, th this is a reaction against reason of the Enlightenment. Okay, So kind of going back to times, the gothic era, before the Renaissance, reason, scientific revolution, reformation, and those intellectual events where we see more and more reason. Well, kind of going back to medieval times where there wasn't as much reason, all right? Um, and uh, Coolridge's, one of Coolridge's most famous uh, poems was uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And uh, I uh, have Iron Maiden next to that because it's a very famous um, song by Iron Maiden in one of their albums uh, where they uh, take actual parts of the poem and, and put it to music. Um, but the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is a story about a sailor who uh, kills an albatross and is subsequently cursed from killing that, uh, that albatross. And it's really a story of a crime against nature and God, but illustrating a curse, you know, supernatural elements, um, fantasy, you know, again, all parts of romanticism. Uh, Wordsworth, very similar. This was Coolridge's uh, closest uh, friend, and he talked about the importance of nature and how uh, the how he wanted to maintain a positive relationship with nature. And we'll be talking about nature a little bit more as we kind of go through uh, some paintings and some of the other artists. But again, nature was re a really important part of uh, Romanticism, especially you know the powerful aspects of it, you know, uh, and man's relationship to it. Uh, Lord Byron, another famous. Uh, uh, figure uh, within Romanticism. He was kind of a rebel of Romanticism. He embodied some aspects of the French Revolution of the Enlightenment, but also, you know, he did acknowledge some parts of Romanticism that were really important, especially nature within his uh, within his work. So Coolridge, Wordsworth, and Lord Byron. All right. Uh, we also had a very famous uh, uh, Scottish Romantic poet that was uh, Sir Walter Scott, uh, and he wrote a lot of historical narratives, ladies and gentlemen, that represented the romantics interest in history and history is going to be so important within romanticism because we are going to be because nationalism is so uh important uh within romanticism and history is a really important part of nationalism people uniting around a shared history a shared culture a shared language history is going to be a really important construct of nationalism which we will be talking more about in chapter 12 but uh some of sir walter scott's uh famous poems is ivanhoe and Rob Roy, history, very important uh, uh, narratives of Scottish history. Literature, ladies and gentlemen, a really important part of the Romantic movement. Uh, Mary Shelley, she was a very uh, famous artist. This is Mary Shelley is the daughter of Mary uh, Wollstonecraft. And Mary Shelley's famous book of the Romantic period was Frankenstein, uh, a story of a, a doctor making this 
creature, this monster, very much uh, 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 embodiment of uh, romanticism, ladies and gentlemen. You have supernatural, uh, you, know, uh, you know, like a fairy tale, okay? Not necessarily empirical, not necessarily, you know, a rational story of reason, okay? So Frankenstein. Um, Goose, again, we talked about him uh, previously within poetry, but he... Uh, wrote a very powerful a story called The Sorrows of Young Werther, and this was a love story of a man who's going to commit suicide by being rejected by the woman he loves. And what makes this uh, uh, such an, um, uh, an important romantic story, ladies and gentlemen, is the emphasis on feeling and talking about these, these emotions, and these powerful emotions uh, and, uh, w with, with, this with this man. And uh, you know, very much an embodiment, again, of romanticism, emotion, human, the human, uh, you know, the human element, subjectivity, really important characteristics of um, of romanticism. Uh, Grimm's fairy tales. A, these are, these are going to be a collection of German folk stories. Um, very important within romanticism because of nationalism. And we're going to talk more about Grimm's fairy tales a little bit later, especially when it comes to the unification of Germany. But Grimm's fairy tales are going to be really important. In helping unify Germany because it's going to help unify people culturally. These are common folk stories all kind of put together and people are going to be able to share this culture with one another and share a common bond culturally. And if people start sharing common bonds culturally, linguistically, those bonds will then transcend to politics, okay? So, and we'll be talking more about that uh, a little bit later, but Grimm's fairy tales are really important within Romanticism because of nationalism. Uh, Victor Hugo, an artist, uh, uh, who's known for The Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, Les Miserables, and, and he, he wrote numerous stories involving fantasy, involving you know supernatural elements, you know, uh, strange settings, but also that important notion of human emotion, subjectivity, a window, an expression into hu the human element. Very important. Here's a picture of Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, Mary Wollstonecraft's daughter. All right, there's Lord Byron. All right, uh, we're also going to see uh, visual arts, ladies and gentlemen, really important within uh, uh, Romanticism. Uh, and one such artist who's very important is Casper uh, David Frederick. He and he was really uh, um, an important part of his uh, work, ladies and gentlemen, was nature, uh, portraying the power of nature, portraying uh, this mystical view of nature. And really, a lot of his uh, art. Uh, was uh, designed around eliciting strong human feelings, eliciting strong human emotions. Okay, but also, and we're going to be talking about this a little bit more as we talk about some of the other artists, again, portraying again that 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 relationship between man and nature, between humankind and nature. And I want you to keep this question in your mind as we look at and talk more about art, but industrialization is going on during this time, and the artists are very aware, aware of that. And there's this question of, you know, has humankind conquered nature? Can humankind conquer nature and overcome the power of nature? Who has the power? And we're seeing the romantics really siding on the side of nature and, and, and showing that infinite power of nature. Okay. Um, and romantics saw nature as a power that could overwhelm humans, overwhelm the smallness of humankind. Okay. And again, here, here's a picture uh, by uh, Frederick, the solitary tree designed to elicit emotions, a peacefulness, a serenity, a calmness, right? but also show the power of nature. I mean, just the vastness. I mean, take a look at this landscape, just the power and vastness of nature. Okay, another one, the wanderer above the sea of fog, and we looked at this in the previous lecture. Okay, the peacefulness, the serenity of nature. But another one, the polar sea or the, the, the sea of ice, right? The power of nature, the power. I, when I look at this picture, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very much reminded of, of the Titanic, okay? Of, you know, the, the, uns, the, the unsinkable ship, right? That, uh, that is going to be, uh, that, is, that is actually, you know, ironically going to sink on its first uh, voyage by hitting an iceberg. And it just, again, reminds us of that question of have humans conquered nature and I obviously obviously the answer is no and I believe that this is kind of uh, uh, illustrated within this uh, this this painting all right uh, Eugene Delacroix is another very uh, uh, 
uh, important uh, romantic artist during this time and uh, the most famous French uh, romantic painter. And uh, Delacroix is known for illustrating uh, nationalism within the romantic movement. Okay, uh, and Delacroix's uh, famous picture is Liberty Leading the People, and this is a painting illustrating the revolution of 1830 in France. And y'all are going, wait, there's another revolution uh, in France? Yes, we're going to be getting to that. There's a few more revolutions in France, but again, illustrating nationalism and its connection to romanticism. And here is Liberty Leading the People, and as you can see, you have Liberty at the very front, all right, holding that uh, that uh, tricolor, the symbol, the flag of the revolution, okay, nationalism. And we're going to be talking more and more, especially in chapter 12, about the emergence of nationalism, uh, liberalism, and conservatism, the isms, um, but nationalism was key within romanticism. We have J.M.W. Turner, ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, returning to the power of nature and the terror of nature, um, and like I said before, depicting that that uh, kind of battle the, between the forces of industrialization of civilization challenging the dominance of nature. And you have a picture right here kind of illustrating that. You have this modern slave ship struggling in the ocean. Okay, struggling in the ocean. So you have these vast machines, these new technological wonders that man is producing, uh, the steam engine, the automobile eventually, uh, you know, can, can man fly? Right, the, these these gigantic uh, ships uh, can man conquer nature, right? And that that's kind of the question. You have the same question kind of posed within within this uh, within this painting right here: the rain, steam, and speed illustrating the new locomotives, the train, right? And it's that question: you know, can man has man has humankind conquered nature? All right. Music, ladies and gentlemen, is also going to be vital to the Romantic uh, movement. Uh, romantic music was very emotional music and often very much connected to nationalism. And we're going to be looking at different um, uh, musicians from different countries kind of displaying uh, nationalism, kind of uh, their country style within their music. And when we return to class, we will be listening to some of this music and you'll be seeing some elements of the music that very much connect to nationalism and very much connect to the vibe of uh, their the, the specific people and nationality. Uh, Beethoven was uh, really important within the romantic music. He was a transitional figure between classical, that we talked about before, right, Mozart, uh, and romanticism. And something that was really important, oh darn, I forgot to spell first right, goodness, uh, but he was one of the first composers to incorporate vocal music into a symphony. Uh, so some new ideas as well into romanticism. But romanticism, when it comes to music, romantic music, nationalism is key, ladies and gentlemen. Nationalism is key. Uh, Giuseppe Verde, really considered the greatest Italian uh, composer within the romantic period. Uh, and his operas uh, and his music evoked a lot of strong nationalist sentiments. And that was really... Uh, uh, really evident within uh, within his music, and some of his early operas can be seen, um, you know, as uh, allegories for the Italian desire to rid Italy of their foreign oppressors and for Italy to unite. And you got those themes, you got some of those uh, uh, messages within uh, Verdi's music, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, Wagner, Richard Wagner. German, all right, composed many nationalistic operas that emphasize German myths, legends, um, but again, illustrating nationalism, really, really, really important. Uh, Tchaikovsky, Peter Tchaikovsky, he was Russian, um, and he often used uh, Russian folk songs in his symphonies. He, his music was used for the Nutcracker and Swan Lake. His uh, 1812 overture is just incredible. He literally has cannons going off in it, but illustrating elements of nationalism within the music. And you had that Verdi's music versus Wagner's music versus Tchaikovsky's music had very, uh, you, could, you could get a sense of their own country. You could get a sense of Germany within Wagner, Italy within Verdi and Russia within Tchaikovsky. You could see that. You could sense it um, within their music and that, that nationalism, very important, ladies and gentlemen. Architecture, ladies and gentlemen. The Romantic era is going to return to medieval uh, ideals uh, within architecture. Again, a rebellion against reason. A rebellion, ladies and, 
and gentlemen against the enlightenment and rationalism of the French Revolution, okay? And there's going to be a strong Gothic revival. They're going to bring it back to medieval times when they're, again, a, re a revolt against reason. So they're going to go back to medieval times where there wasn't necessarily the reason there, all right? And the, uh, the British Houses of Parliament uh, that are going to be rebuilt in the mid-1800s is in, in just a great example of returning to the Gothic roots. And you can see this right here. Here are the British Houses of Parliament. And you can see these tall spires, very gothic, right? Reaching up, 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 up towards the heavens, towards God. Very important and a reminder of that revolt against reason. Religion and romanticism, ladies and gentlemen, in the romantic period is going to be very important. Remember, uh, Enlightenment thinkers uh, derived religion from reason, and some thinkers attacked it altogether. Remember that uh, in, in the Enlightenment. Um, romantics saw religious faith and re religious institutions as central to human life. Remember, this is romantics are revolting against uh, reason, uh, and so we're going to see, um, you know, some new denominations and some new uh, religious institutions and religions, you know, uh, arise during this time. And um, we're going to see this with uh, Methodism. This is a revolt against deism and rationalism in the Church of England. Uh, it was led by uh, John Wesley, and what this was was a very highly emotional a highly passionate and enthusiastic um, sect of Christianity. And, it, and uh, it uh, stressed the possibility of Christian perfection in life. But what was really important, ladies and gentlemen, and very romantic of it, it was very emotional, passionate, centered upon humans. Okay? Uh, and it was very, it was very uh, emotional. Okay? Very important. Okay? Uh, and we're also going to see new directions in con uh, continental religion, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to uh, see the revival of feeling, of passion in religion, that subjectivity. Remember those human emotions, okay, that revolt against uh, reason. Um, and uh, we're going to see numerous uh, religious uh, thinkers uh, like uh, Chateaubriand uh, stress the importance of passion, of energy, of feeling, of emotion within religion. Okay? Um uh, romantic views on nationalism and history, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, romantics believed, even though they were against the French Revolution, they did believe in revolutionary movements. And what's important about this, ladies and gentlemen, it, it that's due to um, nationalism. Okay, now you so you all might be like, wait, Harv, I thought that this was a revolt against the French Revolution and a in a you know a revolt against reason. It the, the romanticism is very much. Uh, more of a revolt against the liberalism, okay, of reason, of the Enlightenment and whatnot. Nationalism is going to be, a nationalism does not equal, you know, the Enlightenment. Nationalism does not equal, you know, the, the French Revolution. Nationalism is its own entity. And I'll be talking about more about that in Chapter 12. But Romantics believed in revolutionary movements when it came to nationalism because nationalism was such an important part of Romanticism, ladies and gentlemen. And Romantics are going to support the nationalistic movements that emphasize the traditions of people, the languages of people, and they, they, they're going to be glorifying uh, this notion that people should be united by their common bonds, culture, language, okay? Uh, and what's important to remember, ladies and gentlemen, is that there can be conservative nationalism, okay? And so a nationalist does not necessarily mean that someone is liberal or a believer in the Enlightenment. A lot of Romantics are not believers in the Enlightenment, not believers in um, you know, the French Revolution in reason uh, particularly, but they do believe in nationalism because they do believe that people should be united around their culture, and that's the point I'm trying to get at. Okay, uh, and So nationalism is vital to Romanticism, ladies and gentlemen. Nationalism is, uh, is a really important theme within uh, Romanticism. All right? Um, uh, Germany, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be a key area of this, and we are on the road, and I've been talking about this, we are on the road to German unification, we are on the road uh, to Italian unification, and Germany was very disillusioned with the French Revolution and Napoleon um, because of the French Revolution, and, and Napoleon had destroyed parts of Germany and reorganized and conquered parts of Germany and forced Prussia uh, into an alliance in, in these wars, and so a lot of the German people are going to be very disillusioned, rightfully so, with the French Revolution and Napoleon, and that's going to push a lot of, you know, German romantics, German thinkers, intellectuals towards nationalistic views of where people are united by their history and united by their culture, and that's that's what's important, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to romanticism and nationalism and history, is romantics were very much proponents of 
people uniting around their nationality, their ethnicity, their language, their culture, and their shared history. And we're going to see that definitely in the 1800s, and we're going to be seeing some big changes. All right. Uh, Herder, ladies and gentlemen, uh, he uh, was very much uh, an important um, uh, philosopher, uh, romantic philosopher, and he rebelled against enlightened uh, ra uh, enlightenment rationalism. He was the leader of the German uh, Sturm und uh, Drang movement, which emphasized feeling, uh, individualism, emotional intensity. Uh, he urged Germans to study German literature and study history. And what's important about this is he was trying to unite Germans, right? Unite people. Uh, from uh, the Western Germany with Northern Germany with Southern Germany with Eastern uh, Germany. Remember, the, Germany, ever since we've been talking about it, has been you know uh, fragmented and and not united. Right? He is urging people to study literature, study history. Um, to uh, you know, he's trying to revive German folk culture to help unite people um, because the people are united uh, linguistically, united culturally, united historically, they're more likely to be united politically, which is very important. His uh, important, some of his most important followers were the Brothers Grimm, ladies and gentlemen, who are going to write those uh, and collect all those folk stories and put it all together for people, for Germans to remember, to help, to help create common bonds between them. All right, and he, uh, you know, he believed uh, that universal languages destroyed individualism. So you know, the importance of knowing the German language. Okay, very important. Italy, very important, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to see the revolution led by Mazzini and Garibaldi. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, but, you know, this had strong idealistic and romantic o uh, overtones. And, um, you know, uh, Verde's operas were thematically nationalistic. And uh, we're going to see Verde and Mazzini and Garibaldi, uh, you know, be very important figures uh, uh, within uh, Italian unification, which just like German unification is on the way. That's going to be, those are going to be f two fundamental, uh, you know, uh, uh, just game changers within Europe during the, um, the, the 1800s, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk a little about Hegel uh, and history. Hegel was a, a German philosopher, um, and he is considered the, the most important philosopher of history during this time, and he believed in this very specific philosophy of the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis, okay? Um, uh, now, the thesis was a predominant set of ideas, and I'm going to kind of talk about each. The antithesis was, uh, you know, conflicting ideas, and the synthesis was a clash of ideas that then became the new thesis. And this is kind of how Hegel thought that kind of civilization progressed and kind of worked. Now, let me give you an example, uh, okay? So, for example, like the thesis might be, um, you know, religion, okay? Like uh, Christianity, um, traditional medieval religion, you know, during the Reformation, okay? Uh, and the antithesis might be, um, you know, the uh, the Enlightenment might be reason. All right, the synthesis, the clash of ideas that becomes a new thesis, we could see is deism, right? That mixture of religion uh, and reason, right? Of where you believe you, you keep elements of the thesis and you mix it with the antithesis, and that becomes a new synthesis. So, for example, with uh, you know deism, right? We have that 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 we, the belief of God, but then you have the belief that God is rational, right? And you can see the mixture creating a new the, the the predominant set of ideas of religion clashing with those conflicting ideas the the uh the reason coming up with a new synthesis of where you see a mixture of them and that's kind of how hegel uh believed um you know history and society progressed and kind of worked in advance and he's actually going to be very um important an important uh um um uh, philosopher who's who's going to have a dramatic impact upon Karl Marx with uh, in his ideals of um, communism, which we'll be getting into uh, in the next few weeks, the next few chapters. Okay, but the implications of Hegel is that he believed that all periods of history are of equal value, and um, you know he, he believed that you know um, you know all periods are important because they're necessary for the development of ideas, and that cultures are valuable to facilitate the clash of ideas, and that you know when ideas clash, then you have a new synthesis that's going to you know further you know um, uh, develop you know human civilization, and humankind, and we'll be, we've already kind of seen that already with with um, uh, uh, you know the Enlightenment with science, okay, the, the notions being challenged and you kind of having traditional notions with new notions being mixed and, uh, you know, progressing uh, within uh, within intellectual thought. And, and deism is a great example of that. All right. Um, let's talk a little about Islam, ladies and gentlemen, the Middle East and Romanticism. Uh, 
uh, the Romantic period, ladies and gentlemen, is going to lead to a, a vast new understanding of Islam and the Arab world. Um, and, you know, Romanticism is going to have very mixed implications uh, regarding Islam. On the one hand, it's going to re uh, renew uh, the tr traditional sense of necessary conflict between Christianity and Islam. However, what's also important, ladies and gentlemen, is that, uh, you know, romantic the Romantic emphasis on the value of different cultures, on the value of... Uh, of people uniting around a shared culture is going to present Islam in a positive light. And we're going to start seeing, you know, popular stories like A Thousand and One Nights, that's where Aladdin comes from, um, you know, start to, you know, be spread kind of throughout uh, throughout Europe. And Europe, Europeans are going to start to have a, a better and greater understanding of, uh, of Islam. Um, Hegel is going to consider Islam an important ideal for the development of humanity, um, and he's not going to necessarily consider it, consider it the most significant, but he will consider it an important uh, piece of development for humanity. Um, we're going to see, you know, some thinkers like Carlyle present a favorable view of the Prophet Muhammad as, you know, the Enlightenment view that saw him as, uh, you know, in a more negative light. Um, and Napoleon in the, in the Middle East, Napoleon, right, in the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, that is going to be a game changer in understanding uh the uh, in understanding the uh, the Middle East and understanding uh, you know ancient uh, Middle Eastern cultures and uh, civilizations, um, and we're going to start to see, ladies and gentlemen, an increase in the number of European visitors to the Middle East, and we're going to also, ladies and gentlemen, start to see more Middle Eastern architecture um, in Europe, ladies and gentlemen. So the, the Middle East, and what I'm trying to get at, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to start to see Europe interacting uh, uh, much more and on a greater level with the Middle East. Um, and we're going to see that in the 1800s and, eventually, and, and definitely during um, uh, the 20th century with World War I, uh, with, the, with the, the mandate system uh, post-World War I, and obviously uh, with the creation of Israel um, post-World War II, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, that's it for today. That's it for Romanticism. That is it for chapters 10 and 11, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Have a, a fantastic day.